The Baha'i faith teaches that throughout history, God has sent to humanity a series of divine educators known as manifestations of God, whose teachings have provided the basis for the advancement of civilization. Baha'is believe these manifestations have included Abraham, Krishna, Zoroaster, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, and the final messenger is Baha'u'llah. In this podcast, my two guests will help us understand more about the Baha'i faith. This is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters, and I am the host, John Moorhead, and my special guest today, I've got two of them. I have, uh, on the one hand, Maruz Madella and Barbara Lachmar, and they are both uh, members of the Baha'i Faith, and uh, we have not uh, discussed that on this podcast before, and it's a, a group that I don't think a whole lot of folks in the audience are going to be familiar with, so I'm privileged to have them both here today. Ladies, welcome to the podcast. Thank, Thank you. you. We're happy to be here. Well, I'm going to put uh, some of the bios that you sent me in the program notes, along with the link to the official Baha'i website. This is just kind of an introductory conversation so the folks can hear from uh, members of the group. But would you take just a, a, a few minutes and just introduce yourselves? Sure. I'm Maruz Madela, and I was originally born in Iran. I was born in a Baha'i family. Uh, we moved to U.S. long time ago when I was about 12 years old. So I grew up in New York, went to school upstate and Ohio State, Texas, and now I'm in Utah. So I'm very happy to be here. Again, thank and, you for being here. Go oh, ahead, Barbara. Sorry. That's all um, right. My name is Barbara Lockmar. Um, I've lived in Utah for about 30 years. Uh, I was raised in a Roman Catholic family very devout Roman Catholic family. Um, my family is still Catholic. In fact, my mother's turning 100 next month, and she keeps asking me to come back to the Catholic faith, which I understand. Um, and so I became a Baha'i at age 20. So that was almost 50 years ago. Uh, and I worked for many years as an attorney in the Cache County area. So I'm retired now, enjoying my retirement and my two grandbabies and all is well. Well, fantastic. Again, thank you both for being here. Now, those bios kind of lead to my next question. I always like before we get into discussing, you know, the history and beliefs and practices and all that, I like the, to begin with the personal element. Would you both mind sharing a little bit about how you came to embrace the Baha'i faith? What's fascinating to me is we've got somebody from uh, Iran who is a member, but we've also got somebody here from the U.S. who has a Roman Catholic background. So, Barbara, let's start with you. What's your story? You know, uh, for reasons I don't exactly understand, I was just deeply interested in spiritual things, even as a younger person, I would say middle school age. Um, and I started to what I call bug God. I used to just like nag God and say, what's all about? What are we doing? I don't understand everything. Please explain everything to me. And I did that for quite a long time. And finally, one day, I just kind of heard, be patient. Everything's going to become clear. So I just said, okay. And so I just waited. And one day, um, uh, a fellow from school that I didn't know very well asked me if I wanted to go to a Seals and Crofts concert. And I don't know if any of you remember Seals and Crofts. They were super popular back uh, when I graduated from high school in 1971. So he took me to that concert and they happened to be members of the Baha'i faith. And they mentioned that. And they said, if you would like to know more about this, you can stay behind after the concert and we'll go over to this local hotel and we'll explain it to you. <clears throat> and again, for reasons I'm not quite sure I understand, my heart immediately resonated with that. <clears throat> so I went to that um, informational talk and I uh, looked into the Baha'i faith after that. And for me, it was the answer to all of that yearning that I had earlier in my life. It, it answered and satisfied my spirit, my mind, my heart. And so I've been committed to that faith ever since. Interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. What about you, Maruz? Uh, although I was born in a Baha'i family, uh, in the Baha'i faith, they teach you about all religions. So I grew up with knowing a little bit of, uh, especially being born in a 
Muslim country, country. So we were learning about all religions, about God in general. And usually the age of maturity is 15 in the Baha'i faith. Um, and you can decide if you want to take more time to investigate other religions before you, or, or you may have just need more time. And nobody forces you that you need to become a Baha'i by a certain age. But that is the age of maturity. And actually, I declared my faith when um, I was 16 years old. And I had siblings that they took a couple more years extra. But I love the foundation of the Baha'i faith because uh, the belief is all the God, God is one, all religions are one. It's just we believe in progressive revelation, just like when you go to school, the first grade, second grade, third grade, um, it's a process and that's what is a progressive. And in the Baha'i faith, we believe Baha'i teachings, Baha'u'llah's teachings apply to today's society. Thank you both for sharing. I think it's important that folks know these aren't just about abstract ideas. These are uh, spiritual journeys and, and these are rooted in people's lives and they give them meaning and purpose. And so that personal element, I think, is so important. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, there probably aren't a whole lot of people in my viewing and listening audience that are familiar with Baha'ism. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. I only know of one book that I, I think I have largely an evangelical Christian audience, and I can only think of one book written maybe in the 1980s. I think it was a very small book dealing with Baha'ism. So you're going to help us understand and learn more through our conversation. Let's begin with uh, the, the history, the origins of Baha'ism. Where, where does it come from? Maruz, I'll turn that over to you. <laughs> um, you know, Baha'i faith started in the East, just like all other major religions. Uh, Baha'u'llah, uh, the Bab actually, which is the gate, the forerunner. So we believe in twin manifestations, the Bab and Baha'u'llah. The Bab is just like the uh, John the Baptist. The Bab came in 1844. His dispensation was very short. It was from 1844 to 18, um, I think about six years. Um, he passed away in 1860. He was martyred, he didn't pass away, he was martyred. So he was the herald of the faith. He came to um, bring the forthcoming of a greater manifestation, which was Baha'u'llah means the glory of God. Baha'u'llah declared his mission. It originated in Iran. And if you look at um, the, a history of the faith, uh, it's about 180 years old. And there are over seven or eight million Baha'is around the world, globally, of all color, race, creed, background. So <clears throat> Baha'u'llah came to really uh, advance the human civilization, to bring unity, peace in the world. So Baha'is as individuals, we work towards that. Our purpose in life is to transform ourselves and help transform the society, build um, a better civilization, peace, uh, unity, unity and diversity. So if Barbara, would you like to add to that more? Well, I'll add um, that right now, because Baha'u'llah, like all the pri prior divine educators, was persecuted severely by the fanatical Muslim clergy of the day, was exiled four different times from his original location in Persia. Uh, he was exiled to Constantinople, to Adrianople, and ultimately into the prison fortress of Akka, which is in Israel. Uh, the world center of the Baha'i faith is now uh, centered on Mount Carmel in Israel, Haifa, Israel. So for Christian listeners, that's probably interesting to know. So many of our world faiths uh, are centered in Israel and the Baha'i faith likewise is centered there. Well, look at you go, Barbara. Here you had, you gave us all that information and you initially turned it over to Maru. So you, you did wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for that. We're working together. <laughs> That's right. Uh, what are some of the uh, more important and significant beliefs that distinguish Baha'ism? Well, 
oneness of God, oneness of humanity, oneness of religion, equal rights between men and women. We don't believe in sameness, but equal rights between men and women. Harmony of science and religion, independent investigation of truth, elimination of all kinds of prejudice, but it's color, creed, race, sex. Prejudice is like a disease in the body that it eats up. Hum humans um, is like, we are one body really. And uh, prejudice is like a disease that eats up the whole body. It affects all of us. So for example, in US, we look at mainly in America is racial prejudice. It is not just an issue of black or issue of white. It's like issue of all of us. We all have to come together and work on racial harmony. Education is very important in the Baha'i faith because the more educated you are, um, the more you are able to investigate the truth, the truth for today independently. Although we believe all religions are one, but we do believe in progressive revelation that we believe Baha'u'llah's teachings apply to the, uh, today's society. But the source is one. So we believe God is like the sun and each ray is the messenger teacher from God according to the age the humanity lives. So we believe that Baha'u'llah's teachings, which I just previously mentioned, most of them, I think there are a few more, um, uh, elimination of extreme poverty or wealth, because we believe that, um, you know, if you're extremely wealthy or extremely poor, there's so many people that are suffering. So it is the issue of all of us. We really have to come together to help eliminate that. Um, I think I'm covering most of it. Uh, Barbara, is there any more that you like to add to? So Mavrus mentioned, and I think for me, um, one of the most profound teachings of Baha'u'llah, and he emphasized this, is that there is only one God, and all of the major religions are a reflection of that light of God. Um, I remember when I was hearing about the Baha'i faith, I was devoutly devoted to Christ. I was a deep lover of Jesus Christ, and I wanted to make sure that my loyalty to Christ was not violated by inquiring or listening to this information. <clears throat> and what helped me with that was this kind of visual that I was given. If you take a piece of paper and you punch holes in the piece of paper and you hold it up to the sun, it's the same light coming through each of those portals. And so the light that was reflected in the pure soul of Jesus Christ uh, is the light that we love and that we are drawn to. And Baha'u'llah says that light is one light. So when we turn our direction to the next point on the horizon, when the light comes up, uh, it is the same light. It is one. And all of the religions proceed from that same source. Their differences are necessary for the time in which they are revealed. And the prophets of God, all of these divine educators could have given us everything. But even Christ himself said, I have many things to tell you, many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them yet. Because like a good teacher, we only provide the information that our students' capacity is suited to. And so as humanity is evolving and progressive and we're, we're uh, growing, these divine educators in their wisdom provide what is necessary for the next step in our evolution as a human society. So Baha'u'llah is saying now is the time for the coming together of the human race as one human family. And so the three onenesses are very pivotal in the Baha'i faith. So the oneness of God, there's only one God, there's only one religion, one excessively revealed through these purely polished uh, divine educators. Their souls are like 
perfectly polished mirrors and the creator's light is perfectly reflected in them. So when you read the teachings of Christ, when you read the teachings of Muhammad, when you read the teachings of Moses, of Krishna, of Buddha, of Zoroaster, and for the Baha'is, for the, the Bab and Baha'u'llah, that light is what is being reflected in their words. And the differences between them are only because of the needs of the particular age in which they're revealed. So Baha'u'llah is drawing us together in one human family, helping us to let go of religious prejudice. And all of these beautiful teachings that Maru's mentioned are designed to remove the us and them approach to life. You know, so many of us today are boxed in it's them and it's me, it's us and it's them. And Baha'u'llah is calling us to a higher vision. Diversity is absolutely touted and blessed. And, you know, we don't believe in uniformity. Baha'u'llah says there's, there's unity and diversity. God created a diverse planet, a diverse world, the flowers of the garden. They're all different fragrances and colors. It is the same way with the human race. We're not looking for uniformity. We're enjoying enjoying the presence of all the diversity, but understanding that we are all children of God, that we are all part of one spiritual connected human family, and to live our lives that way, and to conduct our affairs that way. So all of these teachings that Maru's mentioned are designed to remove the obstacles that prevent us from associating together as one spiritual family. And uh, that was wonderful, Barbara. And I wanted to add that, that Bahola says, Religion should be cause of love and unity. If it is going to create hatred and dissension, it's better not to have a religion than to kill one another in the name of God. And if we look at the world today, many wars, I'm not sure, there are over 40, 50 wars in the world that it is really based on religion. So Baha'u'llah came to really remove that, that religion should be cause of love and unity not hatred and dissension or division. I think you really hit on one of the significant challenges, not only historically, but, but of our time, is how do, we, how do we work through peacefully our, our seemingly very important differences, whether political or religious or what have you. And so I, I have a follow-up question to help understand the Baha'i position on, on the topic of oneness of God and oneness of religion. That there are, as you know, there are different views out there. Some would say that uh, there, there's one mountain and we're all taking different roads uh, through our religious traditions, but we arrive at the same mountaintop. Uh, others would have concerns about that metaphor and would say, well, if we look at the basic teachings of the religions, they're not really uh, different pathways on the same mountain. They're very different understandings of what the mountain is. And so uh, what, what would the Baha'i position be on the oneness of God and the oneness of religions? Are the seemingly irreconcilable differences between religions, are they really just cultural or illusory, or, or is it that through Baha'ism, the, the reconciliation of those seeming differences has been resolved through the teachings of Baha'ism? Help us understand what a little bit more about that oneness of God and oneness of religion means in Baha'ism. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Um, yes, it does. Sure. Would you like to go first, Barbara, or you want me to yeah. go? Uh, well, I mean, I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing, so you're talking about the different paths to truth. And in the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah says each of us is given a mind and a heart and God expects us to use the mind and the heart to determine what is the truth, what is reality. Um, and if you look deeply into the spiritual teachings of all the major world religions, their heart is very, very similar. Uh, uh, love God, love one another, serve humanity. Um, and so, the spiritual truths uh, are very, very similar. Where we get into trouble, I think, is when we um, start to get into the less significant, I would call them the external differences between the faiths. Um, and also the, <clears throat> gosh, uh, let's see. So even though there are differences, 
if we look deeply enough, we can find that commonality and we can determine for ourselves, are these spiritual teachings um, harmonious with one another? Can we agree that God is love? Can we agree that all of us are born to make our journey back to our creator? And, you know, Baha'u'llah says we get into trouble religiously a lot of times when we start to understand the written word of God as a literal um, a literal truth. And so, for example, when Christ appeared, uh, many of the Jews of the time did not accept Christ. And of course, he was persecuted, crucified, and died uh, because some of the people of the time read the Hebrew Bible uh, about what would happen when Christ appeared. And I'm not a Christian scholar, but if I remember correctly, there were things like he's going to sit on the throne of David, he's going to rule with a sword, um, and all of these things. And they said, this is a poor carpenter. This cannot possibly be the one that we were expecting. And they, they crucified him because he didn't match their literal understanding of their own scriptures. So by Baha'u'llah says these are metaphorical spiritual truths. The sword of Christ was his tongue, his knowledge of the truth of God, his knowledge of the essence of life, his teachings on spiritual growth and reality. That was the sword where he divided between falsehood and truth. And of course, the, the throne of David, I'm assuming, is his station as the son of God. And so we need to look deeper than the literal physical um, interpretation of our scriptures and look deeper. What is the spiritual message being given? What is the spiritual truth that is being communicated by these divine educators? And these parables and these Stories are wonderful ways of communicating information, but we have to be careful that we don't take the story so literally that we're missing the point of the story. And I think a lot of the reasons why we come to sort of philosophical disagreements about the nature of reality is due to this attachment to the literal interpretation of our own sacred scriptures. And it, it's a stumbling block for us because we need to look a little deeper and we need to understand what is the spiritual reality there and does it really disagree with the spiritual reality of all the major world religions who talk about love who talk about unity who talk about forgiveness who talk about all the virtuous conduct you know i'll just say really quickly and then i'll give maruz a chance to jump in baha'u'llah emphasizes that god is unknowable for us as human beings his creation we cannot know God directly. We know God through these divine educators and through the attributes that they reflect into the world and that we ourselves have the capacity to reflect. So we know our creator through our virtue. And I think all of us can understand that love is better than hate, that truth is better than falsehood, that oneness is better than disunity. Um, these spiritual truths are simple, but they're profound. And I think there is where you can find the commonality between the world's face. That was wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, Baha'u'llah says, uh, I created thee to know me and to worship me. And we believe that man is created noble. So, and we have the capacity to know him as our mind allows, because we are limited based on we believe that God is limitless, infinite. So it's very hard for a limited mind to really, as Barbara mentioned, to know the limitless. We only going to know God through these uh, spirits, through these manifestations of God. And they come, of course, in human form, so they can, we can relate and we can know. So it's a power that is really beyond us. And, you know, we can call it God, we can call it um, God of our understanding, God beyond our power, you know, power beyond us. But really it is, um, uh, our, we, we, we are capable to investigate, to know, you know, man has two natures. We believe you have a lower nature that comes from more of an animalistic behavior, I would say, what is jealousy, hatred, animosity. And then there is a higher nature that comes from generosity, love, kindness. 
forgiving. These are, we believe, attributes of God. And our job in this physical world is really to develop these virtues, these higher uh, nature, higher virtues. So it's just like, like a scale that you have this lower nature, you have higher nature. So you have to constantly work on yourself. Um, Baha'u'llah says, bring yourself to account each day for death on her that is waiting and you have to have answers for your doings. So we constantly have to work on developing this higher nature. So that's development of your soul while you're in this physical world. Thank you so much for that clarification. I appreciate it, which, which raises another question for me about your beliefs. Uh, the different religious traditions have different ideas about what the human predicament or, or state is. You know, for many Christians, it's uh, the human beings are fallen and, and have a broken relationship with God. For Muslims, we need to submit to God and so on. Well, I think you touched on a little bit uh, just a moment ago, Maruz. What does Baha'ism understand the, the human predicament or challenge or need is in regards to the divine? What's our challenge? What's our problem? Um, you know, we are, uh, Baha'is believe that the soul is created right at the inception. Um, so, Although we are here in a physical world, you know, are we are, um, you know, we are here to enjoy all the physical aspects of life, but the focus of our life should be really in developing our spirit, because we believe that once you uh, leave this world, we believe that um, your physical body is like a cage where a bird, which is your soul, is inside of that cage. So once the physical body is destroyed, you know, you come from dust and you go back to dust, um, your spirit flies and it's free. You're, the bird is free. So you can soar in all worlds of God. So your main purpose in this life is really uh, to develop, to develop your soul, to develop your spirit. And, uh, and, and we don't believe in such that you wait and work on yourself and develop yourself, and then you go out to serve humanity. They go simultaneously. You develop your soul as you're serving humanity. You're transforming self as you're transforming the society. I'm not sure if I have answered your question, uh, uh, John, but uh, let me know. And if Barbara wants to add, please. Well, I think this might be fun to bring up at this point, and I think for a Christian audience, this might be a little shocking, but um, so when you talk about the problem of the human being, Baha'u'llah said, we are created out of love. He says, I loved thy creation, therefore I created thee, and we believe that, that God created us noble, mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, our job in life you know, in the Bible, we are taught that Satan is a separate entity from us and that Satan is out there tempting us and, and going to maybe come and try to take over our thought processes and our choices and, and have us end up in a very dark place. Um, Baha'u'llah says Satan is a metaphor for the ego and for the ins what he calls the insistent self or our our tendency, uh, we all have it. And really the main crusade in life is against the insistent self. So that the ego, the insistent self, the selfish part of our nature, the lower part of our nature, the animalistic part of our nature is trained by the higher, more sublime, noble part of our nature. And that we are the rider of that horse. So we direct the ego the way that we want our soul to direct it so that we are not victims of our own selfishness and our own uh, baser appetites. So really the path through life, I always call it that darn free will uh, because we have been given by our creator the choice of which side of our nature. If, you know that old Native American thing that says I've got a, I've got a um, 
or in the cartoons of, of, of the 50s, you know, the angel and the devil here, you know, and our, uh, our job is to strengthen the noble angelic side of our nature so that it controls or uh, keeps in check the lower part of our nature. And we do that through our free will. We have to make those choices every single day of our lives to keep that insistent self from running amok, from taking over, from causing harm. So Baha'u'llah says every child is potentially the light of the world. And every child is also potentially its darkness. So you can see that in the choices that human beings have made. Um, you get a Hitler who gave into all of his baser appetites and instincts, and he caused tremendous carnage in the world. And you see a Mother Teresa who, uh, whose noble nature dominated her being, and she caused healing and happiness and love for uh, many, many, I don't know how many people. So it's that battle, essentially, uh, and that awareness of the insistent self and the awareness of our noble higher nature and to listen to the higher nature and to allow it to inform our choices. And, and then, of course, as Maru said, we go out and we attempt to transform and meet the needs of civilization as it exists today. What are the needs of our age? How can we make the world a better place? How can we contribute to its advancement? And just to add to Barbara is, you know, we don't believe there is an actual place called hell or an actual physical place called heaven. We believe heaven is really closeness to God. And the further you're from God, um, it becomes hell for you. And uh, we do have the free will, as she's explained, that uh, you choose that you really work on your ca character, um, work on ego constantly. Ego is something that it's a constant battle with ourselves that we have to constantly check it, check our ego. Because we are humans and we have that lower nature, but we have the tools how to overcome the lower nature, not to go with whatever our um, lower nature wants and desires, instinct, the moment. So it's a constant battle, but we have the choice and we are we have the capacity and we can do it each person has the capacity it's all very helpful i think you know we have to understand the the essence i, th I think a lot of things that flow out of the different religious traditions kind of go back to what do you where do you see the human being where, where are we in the universe our relationship to the sacred and, and what what challenges do we face and, and that was very helpful um does baha'ism have its own uh, sacred scriptures, sacred writings? And if so, could you speak a little bit to that? Sure, we have, um, just to get back on, John, what you were saying just before you ended, and it's really true, as Baha'is, we believe we are in the adolescent stage of humanity. You know, we have past childhood, so now we are in the adolescent stage. Uh, there's, there's some Baha'i writings, the, we have the most holy book, it's called kitab i Ahdas in the Baha'i faith. It's the book of laws. But there are so many books written by Baha'u'llah himself and translated in so many different languages by his grand, uh, great grandson. Um, Baha'u'llah had written almost 200 years ago, many years ago, to all the kings and rulers, Napoleon, uh, of, at that time, asking that we need to really come together in order to create a peaceful world globally for humanity, for humanity to advance. We have to really put our differences on the side. We have to really work for the betterment of society, betterment of the world. But many of them didn't listen, but there are a few that, uh, one of them was Queen Marie that became Baha'i at that time. And we do have uh, one or two rulers at the moment that are Baha'is. One is King of Samoa, and I'm not sure of the other one. But the most important thing, there are many books written by Baha'u'llah. Abdul Baha, which was the son of Baha'u'llah, was center of covenant in the Baha'i faith. The guardian of the faith, which was the grandson of ba uh, Abdul Baha, 
um, written many books, translated many as well of Baha'u'llah's writings and Abdu'l-Bah's writings in many different languages. Uh, and now we have, of course, the Universal House of Justice, which is the infallible institution of the Baha'i faith. Uh, the administrative portion of the Baha'i faith is really um, very perfectly, uh, it has stopped the faith from dividing into different sects. Uh, so it's a very complete uh, covenant. Uh, and it's very detailed. I don't want to go into it at the moment. Uh, but uh, yes, there are many, many books written by Baha'u'llah himself. And, and I'll just jump in, John, because I was just listening to a YouTube video. Um, and there was uh, an individual Baha'i scholar who actually worked in Haifa, Israel at the World Center of the Baha'i Faith, and he was assisting with translation. The original writings of Baha'u'llah are either in Arabic or Persian, I believe. Th those are the languages, because that's the area of the world that um, he existed in. Uh, and, you know, we were talking about the insistent self and the ego. And, you know, Baha'u'llah says, our creator never leaves us alone. That's why these divine educators come to instruct us and educate our souls so that we understand what we're doing here, so that we understand the nature of our creator and our own nature. Um, and uh, this man, uh, Dr. Phelps, who was helping with the translation, said that we have only translated about 5% of the writings or the holy scriptures that Baha'u'llah revealed. So we have really an ocean of information that we are working through. The, some of the uh, works of Baha'u'llah that have been revealed are pivotal, like uh, Maru said, the laws. Um, he talks about successive revelation and explains how all of that works. He has mystical works for those who are more mystically minded called the seven valleys and the four valleys. So we really have an ocean of information, not only from Baha'u'llah, but from his forerunner, the Bab, from his son, Abdul Baha, and from his grandson, Shoghi Effendi. And now we're getting guidance directly through the Universal House of Justice. So Baha'is are lifelong learners as we all are. And although I've been a Baha'i almost 50 years, there is there is an ocean of information that I still don't quite, you know, that I'm still learning about. And I always will be. So that's, I find that very interesting and fun as a Baha'i that there's always more to know. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Not only do I spend a lot of time in uh, multi-faith dialogue, trying to learn about other religious traditions of my neighbors, but uh, I, I've I'm constantly learning about my own, the depths of my own religious tradition, you know. I think I learned more about my own faith after going to seminary and receiving, you know, formal theological education than I did when I was in school. So it is a lifelong process for all of us. So I appreciate that. Well, you, you shared some about the beliefs. Can you talk a little bit about the, the practices? You know, for, for Christians, it's things like baptism and and communion or Lord's Supper and worship attendance and these kinds of things. What are some of the important practices for Baha'is? Uh, well, you know, age of maturity is 15, uh, but there's really no rituals or, um, you know, like um, Barbara was explaining before, it's a lifetime of learning and progressing. Uh, there is no, uh, we, it's really, uh, your relationship is really between you and your creator. We don't have any clergymen in the Baha'i faith. We do have an order and an administration. There is electoral process, uh, whether locally, nationally, internationally. There is a body of nine people, uh, and it is uh, the electoral process, if it is locally, if it does by the local community, uh, it's very spiritual in nature. There's no propaganda. There is no, um, you know, it, it's done very secretly and between you and your creator. And this goes from national and international level. So the administration is very complete, but the relationship of person is really between you and God. Uh, and prayers, of course, are very important, whether if it is to do individually in your own home. And we believe blessed is the spot where mention of God has been made and is praise glorified. In other words, you don't need to be in a church, but we do understand, of course, 
There are sacred places. Baha'is do have houses of worship where they gather as a community, they pray together. The energy that is created when we come together, it's a wonderful positive energy. But also as an individual, you have obligation to your God. So you have to work constantly. Um, prayers, just like our, our physical body needs food for nourishment, nutrition, our soul needs to be nourished as well. And at least mornings and evenings, we have to really nourish our soul so we can overcome that lower nature. If we don't develop our spiritual nature to, through prayers and service, then it's going to be very hard to overcome. The, the lower nature will be on the scale in a much higher level. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my thoughts. So go ahead, Barbara, and I think of Wait, the next step. Uh, thank you, Maruz. That, that's so helpful. Um, so Baha'u'llah, although we do not have clergy, we are bound as Baha'is uh, to follow the laws of Baha'u'llah, and there are many. So Baha'is do not drink alcohol or consume any drugs that are not prescribed by a physician. Uh, we are to observe celibacy before marriage and um, have uh, those types of relations only with our marital partner. Um, we are forbidden backbiting. This is very, very important in the Baha'i faith that we do not talk negatively about a person when they are not present. And why? Because again, what is the motivating purpose of God's love to mankind? It's to bring us together. And as soon as you start talking negatively about another person, you influence the perception of that person. And, and so we are forbidden to gossip and to backbite. Um, we are to pray once a day. We have an obligatory prayer specifically revealed by Baha'u'llah. He has three forms of that. One is very short, one is medium in length, and one is long. And uh, the Baha'i is free to choose which of those they wish to um, use. And that's, again, as Maru said, to feed ourselves spiritually. Uh, we're told to study the scriptures and writings of our faith and other faiths um, to understand uh, the revelation of God and to become deepened and more aware of all of the ramifications of the teachings that Baha'u'llah has brought in and all of the manifestations have brought in. Um, we also have a period of uh, time during the year when we abstain from food and drink from sun up to sundown. That occurs in the spring of every year, usually between March, depending on the equinox. So sometimes it's March 1st, sometimes March 2nd. And for 19 days, we get up in the morning, we eat a, a meal, we pray, we meditate, and then we go without food or drink for 12 hours approximately until the sun sets. And we do that for 19 days in a row. And that is a time of of spiritual reflection, of thinking about the year that just occurred and the one that's about to occur and uh, deciding if there's any internal adjustments that we need to make in our character, in our uh, goals in life. And it's just a time of, uh, of deepening our relationship with our creator. Um, we have um, many holy days that we observe as Baha'is and we gather for those. We also have um, meetings where we gather once every 19 days to um, communally or as a community um, take in that spiritual food in the form of prayer, reading of scriptures. Um, then we also discuss the business of our communities and we have a time to just associate in fellowship and friendship with each other. So that's kind of our community. So as an individual Baha'i, uh, we're supposed to tell the truth, for example. Baha'u'llah says truthfulness is the foundation of all human virtue. And without truthfulness, progress and success in all of the worlds of God is impossible for any soul. So truthfulness is crucial to our spiritual development. And all of the virtues are enjoined upon us by Baha'u'llah, just like Christ enjoined upon us, just like Moses, the Ten Commandments. All of these divine educators have always um, sort of communicated on behalf of the creator uh, the sort of personal laws of evolution, spiritual growth, and strengthening through, through the development of these virtues. Mm -hmm. And um, although probably you wonder 19 days, Baha'is have their own calendar. We have every month is 19 days, so we do have a feast or gathering where we come together. And in this gathering, uh, it consists of three parts. It's uh, devotional, the administrative, and then fellow uh, consultation. And then after that is fellowship. Consultation is a very important 
elements in the Baha'i faith. Uh, because through loving consultation, doesn't mean that we cannot have different ideas. Of course, we all bring our ideas to the table, but consultation is um, a key element in growth and learning and development of the soul. Because through this uh, open, loving uh, conversation, consultation, it's many doors open, many ideas that one mind may not think about, but through uh, that coming of together, like I said, the administration of the Baha'i faith is based on nine bodies that are elected. So these nine bodies, when they come together through prayers, through uh, really meditation and then consultation, and once you put your idea or your opinion on the table, you really have to work on the detachment part, to be detached from the outcome of that idea. And all of these things that we're saying is actually, you know, we believe Baha'i teachings are perfect because they come from God. But we as Baha'is, we are just humans. We are not perfect, but we have to strive daily, daily to work on our character, on developing all these wonderful virtues that are given by God, and to have that higher nature on this scale more on a higher level than our lower nature. Um, and, and that said, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was that was great. Thank you so much. As we uh, get close to the end of our time in our conversation, obviously this was just an opportunity for us to kind of get a, a sketch, a, a little introduction to what Baha'ism is all about. And we're going to encourage folks to go to the website and talk to find a Baha'i in your community and, and talk to them and get to learn more. But this last question I have might be a little more challenging, but I think it's an important one. Um, I am aware, I think I saw an article recently on uh, Baha'is and the continued persecution in Iran. Can, can you, you talk to that, the challenges that are faced there and, and why that, that persecution that's going on there? Sure. Uh, you know, Iran is a majority of the country is Muslims and uh, due to their belief. And one thing is that Baha'i faith is not a division of Islam. Baha'i faith is an independent religion originated in the East, but it's not a division of uh, Islam. And uh, being in an, an Islamic, uh, if you really study the history, the loss of their faith. Their belief is that um, if they really study Quran, which is the holy book of Islam, uh, Islam, it does say that there is another after me, but the people have their own limitations and understanding. And their belief that after, they believe is that after Muhammad, which is the uh, messenger of God for that day, there is no other religions. They believe that Islam completed all manifestations of God and there is no more after Muhammad. So being Baha'i, Baha'i faith is about 180 years old, less than 200 years old. They believe that uh, by persecuting, they will stop the faith from growing. And it happened from the inception of the faith. If you really study the history of the Baha'i faith, you will know the persecutions were done from the, done from the very beginning. Baha'u'llah himself was exiled from his own country with his own family under very poor conditions. Uh, so they believe by persecuting, they will stop the faith from growing. But, you know, we know uh, I'm not totally familiar with Bible, but I know there is something said about, you know, the fruits um, um, of the, uh, the truth is really known by the fruits of um, the um, prophet of that age. If I'm incorrect, please correct me, Barbara. So uh, the more they're persecuting the Baha'is, the faith is growing uh, globally. There is over 8 million Baha'is and in Iran itself, there are many, many, especially between ages of 18 to 35, that are turning to the Baha'is. They believe that, um, that you know, it's a trusted source of information. And they turn to, uh, there is a, a radio and TV and social media platform. It's called the Persian Baha'i Media Service. It's not just for the Baha'is, it's for all Iranian-speaking friends. And what Baha'is really 
at the moment are doing globally is a total belief in community building process. Wherever we reside as an individual, because we believe an individual is a protagonist. As an individual, um, we really have to work to become more empathetic and leave, you know, because sometimes there are certain, certain of us that live in an apathetic stage. So we really have to become protagonists of our own uh, neighborhood, wherever we reside, to make a difference. So this community building process, uh, wherever we reside, we have to have a positive effect on the growth and development of the society. And it, we have programs, of course, for children, junior youth, adult, meaningful, elevated conversations that we need to really, instead of focusing on uh, conversations that bring us down or create negative energy to really uh, be uh, in, in elevated conversations about uh, growth of our children. Because like Barbara said, there are treasures of our community. What can we do to bring them to work together rather than against each other, to compete against each other? So in Iran, majority of the people that are being imprisoned or persecuted, they're doing nothing except helping the civilization, helping the humanity in that country to advance. To, they help the children, they help the adult. So there is a lot of um, uh, friends of the faith. I don't wanna call them non-Baha'is, but they're friends of the faith that totally love the Baha'is and what they're doing, but they're afraid to say anything because of uh, the, uh, the people that are in power. Um, so if you're familiar or, or, be, or make yourself a little more familiar with what is going on around in Iran, is that no one really has a voice, even the ones that are friends of the faith. They want to defend that what the Baha'is are doing it's only for advancement. They're not trying to convert. You know, one thing about the Baha'i faith is that we're not here to convert anybody. That is not our job. Conversion is really God's job and between the person and God. But our job is here to share our gift with humanity. We believe that message of Baha'u'llah is a remedy to all ills of mankind, to today's, you know, today's problems of the world a lot of mental illnesses. Of course, there are times that you have to reach out to a professional, you have to reach out to uh, conventional medicine or functional, whatever that your heart desires, but there is a lot of ills of the society is lack of spirituality is really turning to the word of God. So that's all the Iranian Baha'is are doing is trying to help the society, help humanity to advance from this stage of adolescence and persistence of self. So they're trying to help whether if it is on an educational basis, spiritual basis. And so they are just being persecuted and put in prison. And recently they have been looted, confiscated from their properties. They're out on the streets, but Baha'is believe that the answer to all of this injustices is through love, not hate doesn't, you know, through hate and fighting is not going to solve, but through love. And they believe, since they believe in the power of soul and that physical existence is such a short time, right? We look back and say, ooh, 50 years, 40 years pass by like this. And we believe that this physical world is really a very short span of our life here. There is so many worlds of God spiritually. Uh, so they are not there to fight, they're there to change the world for a better place. And that is the only reason, because of their belief, because of their faith, they're being persecuted and they're being put in jail. Barbara, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I think Maru's covered that very, very well. So okay. I don't add. I don't want John for your links, uh, how people can uh, find out more about the Baha'i Faith or not, or if you'll just let them uh, look on their own. Uh, I plan on including a link to the uh, the main Baha'i website. If you've got others you would like to pass on to me in a follow up email, I would be more than happy to to add that. That would be fine. 
And uh, that's it. We invite, actually, we invite our fellow friends to come and work together. It's not about conversion, but it is very important. That's part of our society building that we just discussed that we need to come to work together for peace and unity and universal peace. Well, I appreciate all this, and, and my, my heart goes out to uh, the Baha'is that are, are suffering uh, persecution. I am an advocate of religious freedom, not just for Christians, uh, but for everybody, because if some of us aren't free, then none of us are. And uh, the freedom to believe or even not to believe has to be uh, something that we support. And unfortunately, one of the things that, that many Christians, at least in America, do is uh, they support their own freedoms, but they are very resident to, or, or reticent to support religious freedoms for certain religions that they don't care for. And uh, I think we just need to, we can still disagree and yet respect the freedoms of people to make their own choices and, and choose their own religious pathways. So uh, my heart goes out to those uh, Baha'is who are suffering persecution in Iran, and I think Christians should come alongside them and work uh, towards religious freedom in that and every other context. Uh, ladies, I want to thank you so much for being uh, my guests on the podcast. I want to encourage viewers and listeners to look to the podcast notes where they'll find some brief bios for my guests today, as well as a website for the Baha'is. Uh, take a look at that, and you can find a Baha'i in your community, in your neighborhood, the same way we got this podcast set up. I went there and reached out, gave my personal information, and was connected with these two wonderful local members of the Baha'i faith, and you can do that too. And there's no better way to learn about another religious tradition than speaking to somebody who's in that religious tradition and uh, have an exchange and gain greater understanding. Again, ladies, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you for having us, and thank you for this work that you're doing. It is very healing, and I think a wonderful contribution that you're making. So thank you for your efforts to do this. Thank yes. you again. This is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. I'm the host, John Moorhead. Thanks, everyone, for watching and for listening. Until the next episode.